This week on Ilkara Ham Radio, we still have a little bit of troubleshooting to do on the crossband repeaters. We need all seven of these kits working, and KD6 FTR is going to show us how these are set up and how to use them properly. That's what's coming up this week on Ilkara Ham Radio. So we get out the laptops yet again, and we need to program some things a little bit differently on the radios, and we are adding some frequencies like the local repeater and so forth, just so that we have those in the crossband repeaters uh, if we need it in a pinch. And these are going to be used for other exercises and not just for the gravel rally. Right. Okay, ready? Yep. So these are our, our seven banks with the MISC. Um, Miscellaneous. So what the way we're set up now is because the the UHF was our backhaul frequency, right? It's right. the, the interlinking. What I had done originally screwed it all up. Four four five seven three seven five, and then I went here, and it wasn't seven three; it was seven six two five or something. Each one of them were separate. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm gonna get high now. Yeah, me too. Anyway, so I just changed them all to be pretty much the same for each of those seven CBRs right. until you get to MISC CBR. So now, if we need it to be different, we can we can switch it. So that's what I did. Okay, that was it. And now... Are we gonna, ready to push? No, I already did that. Oh, you already pushed. Okay. But now I'm going to open... I'm going to read... And from the two meter radio. Oh, now you're on the two meter. Yeah, I got to oh, deal with that one. So now we're cloning yeah, from that radio. So we're just importing it in, and then yeah. we should have set so this up differently so that this was turned a little better. And it gets yeah, just turn it. Three that go in. And because with just the one, um, with the wind going, we can make that little hop long. And then we'll move around All right, she's done. So now, now we can look here and see what's in there. So we got one through seven and the MISC CBR, right? So bank one, one four six five three five, mm -hmm. two five five zero six fifty. Yep. Yeah. And it each one is different, so that we can all of them can be a separate number. Fine. And then we have the same thing we did with the four forty, is we have all of those. We have all of the, I think we have all of the pair, I'm um, sorry, all of the Sarah designated simplex frequencies right. to use for cross banding right. there. Yeah. Plus, just I put the repeater in there. 88, down the 88 is in there. So if we ever oh, needed to use it. Now, the other thing we did with it is we turned off the uh, tone decode on right. the two meter right. just to let so. the repeater bring it up. Now, we could turn it back on, it wouldn't be a big deal. Uh, because of what we've done with you the handhelds now, yeah. just no no tone squelch on the handhelds, and all of this just works. Yeah. Something else we discovered while we were testing with Steve was this TOT field here. Yeah. We had it enabled. It Thirty seconds. Yeah, I'm keyed up talking to Steve. Da 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 da, and I hear doot doot doot, and it drops. I was like, what the heck? What just happened? What the? Yeah. So anyway, so it looks blank now. If it's blank, is it three minutes or? Uh, well, here it's just an on or off. Oh, but where we do you set have the to of time? go to comment, I believe, and expert. And no, not there. It's under common. And then TOT lockout. I changed it to zero right oh, here. Oh, okay. So it's unlimited right now. Correct. Now there's a penalty. You could set this thing up so that if somebody hits, if you make it a three minute timer, right. And put a penalty timeout of 30 seconds in there. So oh. after the three minutes, it drops, and it will not come back up after, until that until penalty. Until that penalty. We shut all of that off. Yeah. So. I hear you. Anyway. So uh, I'm going to save this here first because I don't need to make any changes to it. But we're going to make sure. And the good thing is, is we have two files. Right. I just saved it. Now, I can push it. I don't have to. It's already Let's there. Let's just show pushing it just for the video. Ready? Clone. And right, and off it goes. And now you can see it on the radio. You pull back, you can watch both. And we can see 0.46 amps. 
Not much, is it? No. It's just idle, basically. The interesting thing is when that fan kicks on, it doesn't draw much power either. But talking to Steve back and forth, oh, that's, that's done. i got to turn it off. Take this out. Turn it back on. So the, the way this whole system is going to be, it's going to be so easy to train people how to deal with this is let's turn, we, we get out in the field, we hook it up to antenna. First thing, whoever's setting it up, they know that we're on crossband repeat number one. Turn the power on. Brings brings everything alive. They start turning on. Sorry, I'm jumping you. Radios. Then P3 tells you which crossband repeater memory bank we're using. So CBR1 is CBR1. So we're good to go on there. This one's ready to go. Do we it's, have to adjust the power? Uh, maybe. I don't think so. We can boost it up or down. That's P1? And we, P1, yeah. P1? Yeah, so the, the power levels on these, um, we have intentionally locked them to the low two is the highest capability. Which okay. We looked at, I think it's on two meters, I think that low two was 14 or 15 watts. Hmm. And on the UHF, I believe it was about it 7 10? to 10, somewhere in there. So the point is, we don't need a ton of power. Right. And if we do, we can always go in and change this in the mm. in the software mm -hmm. to re-enable that high power capability. Right. But then we have the concern about battery. Right. And other than that, it's all set to go. So. And then because it's CBR1, we've got CBR1 selected on the uh, displays. Correct. So we, then, all of our radios now have that LCD display so that we can actually yes. see where we're what we're set to. And if this box, say something goes wrong with this in the, in, and we have all of them with us, we're out in the place where we need them all, I can grab any one of the other six that we have, the boxes just like this, bring it in, turn it on, and say, it may say CBR7. Right. It might say CBR5. All I need to do is hit this P3 on both these radios and say, we're, we're in number five. We'll go to number five. And then with this one, and now they're on, now they're technically CBR5, and we're ready to go. Question. Since we're using 445-7375 uh, as the, the it's our backbone? Network backbone, yeah. Do we have to change from CBR1 to 5 on the UHF radio since it's the same frequency? To, but trying to get to make it for people a little easier to understand. because there's another thing we can do too with the UHF with that backbone or backhaul is I can shift to this one it says MISC CBR and that MISC CBR has other simplexes many of them right. well, basically I think it's 11 of them and you'll see then we have there in in Kentucky the <clears throat> the South uh, what is it Southeastern Repeater Association I think is what mm -hmm. the Sarah stands for they have designated two uh, I believe they call them transient either emergency or oh, okay. special event repeater pairs right we have both of those set up here so that if we decided to implement one of those using a repeater a 440 repeater at a specific site as one of our linking points. Then, super simple. We set it to repeater one, so everybody goes in on two meters. This repeats out on 440 mm -hmm. to that repeater. And we're good. And it's good. All right, so we put it back on CBR. So one. we'll go back to to one. And I gotta remember which way I'm going. If you keep going down, does it just circle back to one? Yeah, it's just a big circle. Okay. You can go either direction. So now they're both on CBR one. And we're just using tone now. We're not using tone squelch. Uh, so these radios are both set up in tone and tone squelch. They're, okay. they're receive and transmit. That way, not just any stray key up on on a, the one of the like the two meter simplex. Right. It won't just bring up our repeater. Okay. We wanted to kind of control that. Right. But for on the on the handheld end or mobile radios or whatever right. we're using, two meters is our link there. These radios we're not using. A, a tone squelch because we don't need to in most of the places where we're not in a busy city area 
where there could potentially be lots and lots of silhouettes. And for our audience, uh, explain the difference between tone and tone squelch. So tone is, when I press the push to talk and transmit, it sends the subaudible CTCSS tone out with the whatever I'm sending, my right. voice or whatever. And, and we're using for the stop. race 250.3? Yes. Yeah, both sides are set both directions. It's listening for the 253, 250.3, and it's sending it. Mm -hmm. But the uh, the most important part for us is on on these radios, just go to symbol. On this radio, it's not set for a tone squelch. It's only set to send a tone. So when I transmit on 4457375, right. you can see, I'll bring it up over here. You'll see in a second, you'll see the indicator come up that it's a lot, it's receiving, and you'll also see that go into transmit. Right. KD6FTR. So what's happening though, I hear a radio somewhere chirp, but okay. somebody transmitted on two meters mm -hmm. with, uh, with that I would hear whatever's coming out. And the problem we had, and I'm not entirely sure why, I think I know why, was I think we're getting a mixing. When we would set this to our 14688 repeater. Which is a 77 tone. Correct. That was Different getting passed tones, through. I think, yeah, because the linking between the two radios, these pigtails in the back, right? Those, the audio basically happens is any RF comes into the radio, it, it opens the, mm -hmm. the receive with the tone because mm -hmm. it's in tone squelch. Anything, including subaudible tones, are being passed out into that and back into the top of this one, which gets retransmitted. Right. Vice versa, the 880 repeater would transmit in, and it's sending a 77 hertz tone. This would open up, if we're in that mode, send all of that, including a 77 hertz tone, into this radio. Right. This radio then, in turn because it's set to send a 250.3 hertz tone, would also add that into there. And so I think we're either getting, I'll call it garble, or a mixing of two separate tones, and we couldn't get any of our handheld radios to open, to open when we had them in tone squelch. Right. So we said, simple factor, we'll just turn tone squelch off on all of the, we'll call them uh, station radios or Field outside radios, radios. Not, mm -hmm. the, not the repeaters, but on our radios. Problem went away. Problem now, solved. Now we now we have a fully functional working repeater. And so we've got all the programming for VHF and UHF on the laptop. We've got CBR1 basically at 100%, meaning that it's ready. Yep. Like everything's been done, it's been programmed, everything's good now. And we just have to copy that process mm -hmm. and do the other six. Where did I put? And all six will be configured the same. Yep. Awesome. Thanks for that, Mike. You're very welcome. And so we got back to work. We needed to make all six of the others programmed the same. And we were also talking about documentation that we want to go in each of the kits. We'll do laminated cards, probably something along those lines. We want to make it so easy that anybody can go put one of these out in the field. Now, remember, we're doing this mainly for the gravel rally. That was the whole impetus for putting all of these kits together. But these can be used for all kinds of other projects, other uh, out in the field events, uh, corporate sponsorships, uh, not corporate, sorry, but just sponsorships uh, when you do a 5K race or if you're doing some kind of a walk or what have you out in the community. And so we're going to reuse these over and over again, sometimes in pairs, sometimes maybe just one at a time. But there'll be club assets that we can use easily with good documentation, properly tested. And at least for the race, we have seven. We actually only need six, but we'll have seven of these in case one, for whatever reason, becomes unusable. And that's basically what we got done on this, uh, on this day. But I wanted to show Mike going over how to turn things on and get things programmed. And then with the documentation and training, we have uh, uh, on Thursdays, the third Thursday of every month, we have a club event called Hands On. And we do training at Hands On. We build things at Hands On. And what we're going to do is we're going to bring one of these to the Hands On uh, uh, meeting. And we're going to go over with everybody, how do you set one of these up? How do you use P3 to select the correct crossband repeater frequency for that particular location, for instance, uh, or whatever frequencies we might need? And with good training and good documentation, these crossband repeaters are really going to come in handy. Keep in mind, folks, 
we get a lot of comments about why are we doing this at all. And if you're joining this uh, series kind of late, the reason is we don't have a good repeater that's reachable in all of the locations that the gravel rally is using. We're way down in these valleys and haulers, and the repeater, the we'll say air quotes, the local repeater just isn't reachable. And that's why we're using these crossband repeaters to relay radio communications down in the valley up to the ridge and then from the ridge to net control, or as they like to say for the race, clerk of the course. And that's why we're doing it this way. We have racked our brains a lot. Uh, you know, people have asked, you know, why don't we use HF for this? Well, because the race event folks don't use HF at all. We're lucky that many of them are technicians uh, as far as uh, amateur radio. Um, and so we're, we're not using Invis or anything like that. But this is going to work really, really well because we've already done this for two years now. This is not our first radio uh, rodeo. And we've been using equipment that can do cross-band repeat, but is it really made for the duty cycles that we have been uh, putting the, the radios through? And with separate radios this time, we feel like we'll have much better coverage, much better uh, uh, use case uh, for, the, uh, for the amount of time that they're going to be communicating back and forth uh, on the frequency. So that pretty much uh, uh, gets us to how they're going to work. But we still had to do a little bit of troubleshooting. When we got to, I think it was CBR kit number six, we ran into a problem again. So we noticed that when we would communicate on two meters, the uh, kit here would work. But when we would communicate on the 440 frequency back the other way, it was not going through. It wasn't repeating. So we had to figure out, is it a cable problem? Is it a radio problem? We started with the cable uh, just to see if maybe that could be it. And the great thing is Don AC40M has one of these breakout boxes here uh, that uh, we can connect the, the various wires for the various cables coming out of the radios and see if we're seeing the right, uh, you know, receive, transmit, uh, PTT, and all of that coming out of the radios. And I believe once we kind of played with this for a little while, we I think we finally decided the UHF radio, similar to the one that Chris had in his video, the uh, UHF radio was not transmitting correctly. So uh, once again, we've got a UHF radio not quite uh, working as we had hoped. So uh, we've got a couple of radios, I believe, coming from a viewer of the uh, of the program here, and uh, we're going to incorporate those, and hopefully those will work as they're intended. Of course, AC4DM has all the documentation for the RS-232 cables and how the uh, the cables um, will communicate from one radio to the other. We had to check all that just to double-check and make sure. In IT, we call that um, uh, the OSI model Layer 1, and we're checking Layer 1 stuff here, physical stuff, to make sure that we haven't overlooked something. And here we have AC4DM, again, checking to see if we have the right voltage or the right continuity coming out of the radio. Folks, it's projects like this that your club can take on as well. That's why we show these videos. We want to give your, you and your club ideas for what you could be doing in your community. Look at what we've achieved in the last few months with these crossband repeaters that will be multifunctional, but mainly used for the uh, Macquarie Gravel Rally in April. But your club and many of your members can get involved and get hands-on involved uh, and learn about their radios in ways they wouldn't be able to otherwise. Could we have purchased a repeater? Yeah, we could have. Could, it would have been much, much more money than we have as a club. Can we put these together and learn a lot from the project? Yes, and that's what we have done. Um, Don has created repeaters like this uh, from these types of radios for years, and or radios very similar to these. And so why not use this as a learning opportunity for members in your club. I'm KY4 BDP Brian for the Lake Cumberland Amateur Radio Association. We hope you enjoy this series. We hope you like and subscribe and stay tuned as we get into the antenna portion of these kits in the very near future. 73 everybody.